Hi, I just want to say a big thank you to Dunjiang University for letting our students come in and look at the equipment that's covered in this unit and also giving them the opportunity to do their extended essays. Lesson 11.3, Spectroscopic Identification of Organic Compounds. These are the objectives that we're going to cover. So the methods we're going to use are based on the electromagnetic spectrum, X-rays, UV, infrared, and nuclear magnetic resonance, and the way that they interact with the compounds. Coupled with hydrogen deficiency and, and mass spectrometry, we're going to use those to determine the structure, purity, and composition of a substance. So just a reminder from topic two that you are going to know have to know how to use these equations here and they're from your data booklet basically it just shows you that the energy of a photon uh, can be worked out using the frequency and the frequency and wavelength are also uh, interrelated with this formula so basically we can use the frequency of photon emission to work out what has happened with the interaction with the compound. First we're going to cover infrared spectroscopy. Now infrared stress, uh, spectroscopy is affected by changes in dipole moments. So you can see here if you bend, this is a symmetric bend, if you bend this down here there will be an increase in negativity down here. If you squish these together um, there will be an increase in a change in negativity here if these bonds are different lengths. But if you bend these out at the same rate uh, symmetric stretches, uh, this will still be a non-polar molecule so there won't be a change in the dipole moment. Uh, so only asymmetric stretches and symmetric bends will cause this uh, change in negativity electron density balance. This next slide here shows that based on Hooke's law uh, we have the amount of force here and the amount of stretch. So here we have a bond length here, this is the radius of the bond length and so if you can see the more you stretch out uh, you, the more force you've done to stretch out the, the bonds between these two atoms here uh, the higher the amount of energy goes so this is the energy here in wavelength uh, wavelengths um, so what you can see here is of course a lighter atom would be able to get out further and, and create uh, a more of an energy uh, absorption here. Stronger bonds also give out higher energy because you need more force to, to change those. So another thing to remember here is that the wavelength numbers, the wave numbers between 300 and 1400 are unique to every molecule so we call that a fingerprint. So you can see here is an example of ethanol, the infrared spectrum of ethanol. You can see that these points here uh, for bonds with lighter atoms with the hydrogen on there. These are much bigger atoms and so they are not able to uh, absorb as much energy here. So the percent transmittance has, has dipped at these, these places here uh, and that's because these bonds, the infrared interaction is going on with these bonds. 300 to uh, 1400, the fingerprint region is around here. Problem one now, we're just going to look at the infrared spectrum here. Uh, so the infrared spectrum of an unco unknown compound X of molecular formula C3H6O2 is as follows. Identify the peaks, the ABC peaks. So we just draw lines down from there and we get 2900, 1700 and 1200. And so we go to the, da the data booklet and we can see the possible choices here. So for 2900 uh, it's a very strong and broad band, uh, so that gives us a carboxylic acid. There are other bands here. We can see that for all the strong bands here, they're, they're all OHs. Uh, so let's go for an OH in this one. In particular, they're broad, strong and broad, so we're going to stay away from the CH bond there and write an OH in there. All right, uh, band B1700, that only goes into the C double O bond so there's no choice there and the 1200 if we look at the data booklet that only gives us uh, a C O bond that forms part of an alcohol. So if we match those things up uh, a compound that contains uh, a C double bond O and OH bond uh, and matches with 
we can draw out a particular compound here so let's go for a carboxylic acid and that count up the number of atoms and that matches and so in the absence of being able to draw something else uh, that is one of the possible choices the next method we can use to analyze what sort of compound we have is proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy HNMR uh, and this time we're using the radio wave part of the electromagnetic spectrum and so we're looking in this particular case it's the spins of the hydrogen atoms in the presence of a magnetic field uh, at that at that influence the way that radio waves interact with it uh, and so we call this a chemical shift and we have we relate this to a standard which is tetramethyl silane and we measure it in parts per million of the proton using the symbol delta and just to demonstrate to you how the different spins of protons influence each other I've put this magnet here which represents a spin so there's a north-south so that one directions up the other directions down so just as a reference here you can see here I just put one paper clip to show the strength of the magnetic strength of one proton spin uh, so just in the typical magnetic sense all the protons spinning in the same direction in a particular section would be a domain and I'm just looking at one uh, one spinning proton. So now I put uh, two other protons spinning in the same direction with this first hydrogen proton uh, and you can see here that when you put those together like that so when there are in this particular sense here the different protons the two other different protons are de-shielding uh, and helping the magnetic effect of this spinning proton here to be much greater and so you can see that the effect on the paper clip is much more. Uh, this is also called a downward chemical shift, so it actually manages to spin it more. Now when the protons the proton is spinning around and the protons the, the neighboring protons are spinning in the opposite direction, that's called a shielding effect. And that decreases the magnetic capability of the central the magnetic effect of the central proton. So as you can see so this here demonstrates basically the central spinning proton and its magnetic effects and the difference between shielding and deshielding spins so uh, deshielding that spin with it and shielding that spin against it and how that weakens or strengthens its magnetic effect so here we have uh, the tetramethylsilane standard here and then it's uh, the magnetic effects here are reflected here so you can see that the different hydrogens here and their effects and you can see that there are three different environments here with the hydrogen and correspondingly there are these to respond to the three different peaks in the proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy graph so this one here uh, this one here and this one here now the breakup of these individual lines here will be discussed more in high level. So the problem here, the proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum of X with molecular forming C3H6O is shown below. Deduce which of the following compounds is X and explain your answer. So if I draw lines down to here, I approximately get uh, one reading at about 10, one at about 2.5 and one at about 1. So if I look at the possible examples here, the 10 is pretty much only leaves us with this um, aldehyde compound here. And so uh, we'll write that in. The one is pretty simple too. That only leaves us with a methyl group. The 2.5 now uh, could be a, a range of choices here. Due to the size of the compounds, unlikely to be the phenyl group because that is C6. Uh, we don't have that many carbons. So we're left with some sort of carbonyl group. And so if we look through this, the first compound here, uh, that is uh, pro propanone to ketone, that there only has hydrogen in one type of environment. And there are three peaks here, so that, that possibly can't possibly be the answer. Now if we draw out the structure of the other compound, the alcohol, 
Uh, you can see hydrogens are in four different environments, so it can't be that one either. So just by looking at the hydrogen environments, the middle one has three environments, so it must be that. If we draw out the compound, it also matches with those different peaks. Uh, and the peaks also match out with the 3 to 1 ratio. Uh, so the compound must be the aldehyde, so propanal. Index of hydrogen deficiency now. This tells you how much unsaturation is in a molecule. So that can either occur by having double or triple bonds or by having rings. So these are examples here. So you can see here, this one has an index hydrogen deficiency of four because there's one ring. Uh, and there's one, two, two, three, four, one, two, three, double bonds. So that makes a total of four. So one ring, IHD1, IHD1, a ring and two double bonds. Uh, and this is getting a bit more complicated over here. So you can count them up when you have a molecule and work out what the IHD is. The other way to work out the index for hydrogen deficiency is to use this formula uh, and unfortunately you're going to have to memorize that. Now I've tried to work out a way to learn that uh, and that would basically come from the formula for an alkane and you use to work that to work out how many hydrogens there are. Uh, so in a normal compound you're trying to get zero as your index of hydrogen deficiency. So what you're trying to do is if you can get the number of hydrogens and minus it using that formula and minus it from the number of hydrogens that's zero. Uh, and so that is one way uh, you can get zero if the thing has zero in there. Another, if you have a nitrogen on there, the net effect of having a nitrogen on there is to create that extra hydrogen. So N is plus, any extra N's add one hydrogen and the effect of having a halogenic alkane is basically to have removed a hydrogen so any halogenic alkanes in the formula you can pretty much assume there is a minus H for that. Okay so losing a hydrogen or gaining something else is the effect of 2 so all is divided by 0.5 so when you lose something uh, you're also gaining something. So there are some sort of hints at, at how would you get the plus or the minus, the oxygen has really no effect uh, that there is to get this, the base number of hydrogens and minus it from itself uh, and then you would divide everything by 0.5. Now converting these things here to effectively a ring pretty much means you've eliminated two hydrogens here to create that ring or if you've created the double bond uh, such as here you've pretty much eliminated two hydrogens there. So uh, whenever you've done this index of hydrogen deficiency, it's two hydrogens that have gone. Uh, and so that's a way to, to explain, another way to explain that 0 0.5. Problem one, work out the index of hydrogen deficiency for C6H6. So we write out the formula that we've learnt. Uh, so there's the six the, carb the number of carbons is 6 and the number of hydrogens is 6 so we sub those numbers in there uh, so the, the, that works out to 8 times 0.5 so the index of hydrogen deficiency is 0.4 you are to work out, uh, you could be asked to work out which compounds it is and you can see with all of these if I count them up uh, that they are, that the number, if you count up the number of double bonds and rings uh, they all add up to 4 Finally, for standard level, this is mass spectrometry. And mass spectrometry basically ionizes the compound, breaks it up into little pieces, uh, sends it off, and the heavier pieces are the ones with great, uh, the heavier pieces or less charge don't move as well and get detected at the end. Uh, you no longer have to work out how the machine works, but it would be good to have a look at it in your textbook or the teacher to go over that in your class. Here I have uh, it demoed for you. I've got two different size uh, fragments here. So these fragments have been uh, hit with energy and so they've been broken up to pieces. They've also been hit with energy so they've become these positive fragments and the electrons are being knocked off. And you see here when I have the larger fragment, uh, because it's larger the momentum of it, it uh, bends and lands in this spot here. Now when I add a smaller one, the blue one, it actually gets uh, deflected a lot a lot more by the magnetic field and so it bends a lot more and so that will show up on the graph of the mass spectrometer. So here we see a compound ethanol and it really will look a lot messier than this because absolutely everything will be broken up, every single bond will be broken up. You usually start off by first picking on the larger fragments um, 
and you count what you do is you, you use your data booklet and you, you look up the mass uh, the molecular weight of these things so if you've got this as 12 plus uh, 3 hydrogens this will add up to 15 so that one will correspond to here so it'll, it'll be a fragment um, here with the charge so CH3 plus make sure you put the charge in there that's actually wrong it should have a plus in all of these ones and so this this OH fragment here uh, this is oxygen so it's 16 plus 1 is 17 and so that fragment there so you can see they all line up according to various amounts in various sizes and so the larger fragments here uh, this one here is just simply ethanol that uh, gained a charge and actually hasn't broken so that's always going to be the first and largest one and so that'll be the largest one here on the relative mass charge spectrum it'll be this largest one here and it'll have a charge so back to this problem here but this time we're only looking the at the mass spectrum uh, so using this deduce what is happening with this compound xc 3 h 60 at 7445 and 29. So what I do normally is I, I break it at the most obvious parts. Uh, so what I've done firstly is, is add up the entire molecule and it's 74. So surprise, surprise, the whole thing with the charge is, is 74. So that must be the first fragment. Make sure I put the plus there. And then I attack it at the obvious weak points, uh, snap it in half, etc., and add up all the little bits and pieces and see what I get. Uh, and it works out quite nicely. Um, if you add up the molecular weights, it adds up to the pieces that I've shown in there. Uh, and so that's how you know what fragments are at each bit. Okay, and so you've got a, a wide range of techniques to put all the whole heap of pieces of uh, puzzle, the puzzle together to work out the structure of all sorts of different organic compounds.